Okay, and we are live. Today is May 13th. It is a Sunday evening here in the U.S. And what I thought I would do this evening is just relax. I have my evening beverage here. Just drinking a glass of beer here before bed. I thought I'd stream. I, I don't know how long I'll stream tonight. Maybe an hour. Maybe an hour and a half. Maybe longer. We, ju we usually just wing these things. The topic for discussion tonight is going to be the uh, all the news surrounding the malware that has been found in some of the Ubuntu snaps in the snap store and uh, some of the impl implications behind that uh, you know and basically asking the broader question of are snaps safe or flat packs app images PPAs arch pack or AUR packages anything you <laughs> install from a script found on github hell I, I give you guys the uh, the link to my github repos sometimes you know I've got things posted on there a lot of them are just you know config files but occasionally I put bash scripts or shell scripts or stuff in, in my uh, repos on github can can you trust me <laughs> uh, but we'll get into that that discussion here as more people join the chat Speaking of the chat here, we already have a few people that joined this, this stream here. I only decided to uh, to stream about 15 minutes ago, <laughs> so i um, surprised so many people, uh, I guess, got the notification. We got Mars in the chat. He was asking about uh, the Manjaro i3 edition. He mentioned it's really slick because it's how pre-configured it is out of the box, and I would agree. I'm, I'm running the Manjaro i3 edition. You guys know that in the last 30 days because I was doing my tiling window manage, manager challenge living in a tiling window manager although I wasn't using i3 I installed Manjaro i3 i3 is installed on here but I installed Qtile and Xmonad also <laughs> so I've been living in those tiling window managers because I didn't want to live in i3 yet because I still have to review i3 as part of the obscure window manager project I still need to do a video on i3 and I want to come at it from a, a fresh perspective so and we also have Nick in the chat. He says, "Howdy, howdy, Nick." Uh, Stacy is here. What's up, Derek? First live stream I've I've attended. Good to see you, Stacy. Ansom is also in the chat. Hello, PCE Nuggets from Source or Bust. <laughs> uh, human being says, "Hey there." And we have what? Demon deals and codes. Howdy, fellas. Ben Fitzpatrick is also around here. Let's see. Hi, Derek. How's it going? What's up, Ben? Good to see you. We have a few people already in the chat. Kerwin Jones. How's it going, mate? He says, hey, DT. Kerwin is a is an Aussie, so I'm not sure what kind of, uh, what the time is down under. But I'm glad he could make the stream tonight. We got Pingu Void. Good evening. Good morning, depending on time zone. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> with time zones for some of us it's morning for some of us it's afternoon for some of us it's in the middle of the night uh, human being this is your first live chat with me as well cool carl schneider is in the house happy mother's day yep yeah, i hope everybody got to spend a little time with mom today yeah kerwin mentions 11 30 where he's at 11 30 a.m okay tim f is in the chat Tux thirteen thirteen, and yeah, deals and codes. Yeah, nine thirty three p.m. So you're in the Eastern time zone. I'm in the Central time zone. So it's one hour earlier for me. It's only eight thirty here, but get slate quick. Three thirty three a.m. in Germany from Pingu Void. Uh, Fabian is also in the chat. Okay, we got a lot of people here early this evening. Especially since I didn't give you guys much of a heads up, but I was had a little free time. I really wanted to make a video on this topic because it's kind of a big deal. And you know what? I don't have that much free time. You know, I just got home from work. We had a couple hours here. Do I won't really want to do a video? You know, spend a couple hours editing audio, video, clipping things together. You know what? We're just gonna do it live. I'm like. Bill O'Reilly. Let's do it live. <laughs> so, that way I don't have to edit anything. Whatever gets said here is here on YouTube forever. I don't have to mess around in Audacity or Caden Live or 
anything like that. So, in a lot of ways, doing a live stream is a lot easier on me. Although I do like, uh, you know, recording videos, pre-recording them, you know, able to get a, a more polished product sometimes. But doing live, I don't mind doing live, even if, you know, mistakes happen. And by the way, you guys in the chat, I'm assuming the audio and the video is fine. I can see the uh, the video because I'm watching the live preview in YouTube, but I'm not connected to the desktop audio, so how are the audio levels? If I need to adjust it, I will. And we've got Kay Crimson in the chat. Alan Rocco's also here. How are you guys doing? All right. <laughs> uh, I see Ben I missed uh, earlier in the chat Windows 10 has finally pushed me over <laughs> I'm finally erasing off my desktop and I'm going full Linux yeah it's time yeah you know once you just eliminate Windows from your life it, it's not that bad of a situation like I, I don't miss it you know especially the longer you go without Windows I mean uh, I haven't used Windows in so long I don't even know what I would be missing, to be honest, so it's not a big deal. Uh, it's kind of like all those years you used Windows and you didn't know anything about You didn't know Linux existed. You didn't know what you were missing because you didn't even know. It's the same thing. Once you get off Windows, it's, you know, you're not missing anything. Okay, everybody says the audio is good. Great. All right, well, let's get in a little bit into the topic here since we already have quite a few people in the stream here so obvious obviously the big news today earlier today uh, this morning I first noticed uh, some of the stories floating around about the malware found in a couple of snaps in the Ubuntu snap store and let me pull up an article for us all to to check out here the font may be a little small but I'm gonna read most of it this is Joey Snedden's article, uh, he posted this, I guess, about eight hours ago on OMG Ubuntu. Now, I think I included a link to this article in the description, too, for those of you that want to read along. But basically, malware has been found hiding inside software on the Ubuntu Snap Store. A pair of seemingly normal apps hosted by the canonical-backed app hub were discovered to contain a cryptocurrency miner disguised as a systemd daemon. So basically what this guy did, he uploaded to you know, seemingly normal apps, but in, in the code, he hid a cryptocurrency miner. He disguised it as a systemd daemon, so he named it systemd something another. So you know, if you guys were looking at system processes, say you opened up HTOP, looking at some of the processes running, uh, instead of seeing something like cryptocurrency miner running, you see something named systemd something another, and you think, oh, it's just a systemd process that's always running in the background. No big deal. No, it, it is kind of a big deal. He was using your system resources, basically, to mine for Bitcoin. <laughs> so, <laughs> or whatever cryptocurrency he was mining. It was probably Bitcoin. I, I didn't research it to see exactly what he was trying to mine. Looks like uh, he had also, in his code, included an init script so that this auto-loaded, so... You start your machine, boom. It starts uh, mining for cryptocurrency right away. And for most people, they're never going to find this in the code. They're never going to, you know, again, you look at your processes, you're not going to think anything about, you know, why this system D daemon is running. You just think, well, it's just one of the many parts of system D I don't know anything about is running in the background. <laughs> uh. I know some people love to hate on System D. I don't want to start anything about System D as far as the hate, but because uh, I actually quite like System D. Anyway, reading a little further, the code on these two apps in the Snap Store, there was a guy that found the malicious code. He has a GitHub page. I don't know how to pronounce his name. T A R W I R D U R is his username on GitHub. I linked to his account on GitHub for those of you interested in this fella. I don't know if you know anything about him, but this particular user found the malicious code in one of the uh, programs on the Snap Store. It was both programs were games. And he found this malicious code in a game that was a, basically a ripoff of 2048. 2048. This is the GitHub page for 2048. 
I won't link this in the, de in the description because I don't want any confusion. This is not the Malicious app. This is a game that's been around for a little while called 2048, where you join numbers, you get to the 2048 tile. I don't know, some kind of puzzle game. I've never played it. Popular game, though, called 2048, licensed under the MIT license. This guy took this game, repackaged it, called it something else. Uh, 2048 Ubuntu, I think is what he called it. 2048 Ubuntu something. He licensed it under a proprietary license, put it in the Snap Store. And that was perfectly legal for him to do that because the MIT license is a very permissive license. It lets you take, you know, this game, 2048, which is licensed under a free license, the MIT license, but you can take that, fork it, do whatever you want with it, and repackage it put it under a proprietary license, make it closed source. The MIT license allows you to do that. A, a lot of free licenses, unfortunately, allow you to do that. Some of these very permissive licenses, the GPL license restricts you from doing that. This is one of the big things that you know Richard Stallman is out there preaching about. That's why he created the GPL. That's why the GPL has so many uh, restrictions. That's why the GPL is a little bit of a longer license because it restricts people from doing what this guy did. We'll get into that later though. Anyway, so this GitHub user, he found the malicious code. What does the malicious code look like? Well, somebody posted it here on Reddit. The guy was not even really trying to hide the code. I mean, bash script here, currency equals BCN, uh, the name of the program, 2048 Ubuntu, I guess. Anyway, he has this systemd daemon running and it includes an email address. The email address, my first Ferrari at protonmail.com. My first Ferrari. So apparently the guy thinks he's going to buy his first Ferrari <laughs> by mining cryptocurrency <laughs> from people that uh, mistakenly install his apps on the Snap Store. I don't know. I'm assuming this is a joke. And I, I really want to believe this is a joke, actually, because the guy, again, he didn't try to hide any of this. What I imagine the guy was doing. He was trying to bring awareness to the fact that there are these vulnerabilities with snaps and another package formats. He could have done this with Flatpak app, app image. He could have picked any package format he wanted to, to do this on. He could have done this in any of them. But he did it on snaps, and I imagine he's doing this to bring awareness to it because, again, he didn't try to hide what he was doing. And, to be honest, he didn't really do anything malicious. There was nothing bad about what he did yeah he took some of your system resources he's mining for bitcoins or whatever yeah that's bad but you know what he could have done he could have broken your your system he could have done permanent damage to your machine he could have stole data from you stole your emails financial information whatever i mean just the sky's the limit on what he could have put in here but didn't he put something kind of harmless really <laughs> in this so I'm, I'm i'm assuming this guy may have just been doing this kind of as a joke just to bring awareness to the situation uh, i'm going to go back to the chat for a second i've missed a ton of chat while i was going through that but i really wanted to get through the news article and some of the description of what was going on there so i'm going to scroll back up a little bit you guys won't see some of the comments that have already scrolled by but i'm going to try to read some of the ones i missed uh Uh, let's see. Yeah, so a lot of comments about Ubuntu. Alan Rago mentions, mentions damn Ubuntu. It's not it's not anything that's really the fault of Ubuntu. And we'll get into <laughs> that. It's not the fault of Systemd. I knew I was going to receive a ton of stuff about Systemd here. Uh, let's see. Where is the lead dev of Void? We'll get into that topic later. And somebody mentions he, he might be a ditch some in a ditch somewhere. That's possible. When you don't hear from somebody in months, they could be deceased. They could be in jail. They could have serious health issues. There's no telling what happened to the guy. We're going to get into the GPL license. Jick, uh, I'm sorry. Nick Knup mentions he only used the GPL. Yeah. Uh, some of these very permissive licenses, free licenses, they're too permissive. Things like the MIT license. I think the BSD license is very similar. Um, they allow people to do too much. Where the GPL says, 
this was free software when you got it. It's got to be free software when you pass it on to the next person, etc., etc. You cannot add any further restrictions than what's already been, you know. You can't make it closed source. You can't do any of that with something that's licensed under, under the GPL. And that's legally binding. You could take somebody to court if they played with the GPL in a way that wasn't compliant. So, oh, Mr. Go F Yourself is in the chat. He says, hey, DT. Hey, Mr. F. Let's see. We got some Debian love from Real Talk and Pingu Void. Yeah, I'm a big Debian fan. Long time Debian user. One of my favorite distros. And some Arch i3 love. Does every Arch user use i3? It's strange. I mean, that should be like the default desktop for Arch. You know, instead of having, you know, you install Arch and you come to a command prompt and you have to choose what desktop environment or window manager install, Arch should just install i3 by default because I've never met an Arch user that was running anything other than i3. It's strange. Oh. Mint is awesome. Pingu Void, yeah. yeah my squeeze an arm running CentOS, KDE. Very cool. Yeah, it's another rock-solid, stable distro, very similar to uh, Debian in that respect as far as how stable CentOS is. Of course, Ben Ben uses Arch Gen 2, Linux from scratch. He doesn't use a window manager. He uses XFCE. XFCE is very nice. All right, so I was... Let's see. Did I miss anything here? I, I went through that very quickly here. The names of the programs, again, uh, that the guy was uh, 2048 Ubuntu and the name of the other one was Hextris. It was very similar in name to Tetris so it might have been a, like a Tetris game. I'm not sure. But anyway, they were very simple apps. He basically took something that he could, you know, rip off. It's licensed under the MIT license. I can take it. Name it something else. Make it a proprietary license and that is one of the reasons why Canonical didn't find it. Now, even if he had made it open source, Canonical's not finding this code because, quite frankly, nobody uh, vets the packages in these repos. Uh, the only vetting that R R Canonical, or actually most distros do, they have some kind of automatic testing to ensure that the program installs correctly and will work. And if it passes that, it's good to go. Uh, now, in your core repo, like the core apps, like Ubuntu has a core repo, Arch has a core repo, yeah, there's more vetting done on those, because that stuff, a lot of that stuff is actually installed on your machine by default when you get it. They want to make sure that they have that stuff squared away, but a lot of the stuff in the extra repos, the community repos, snaps, flatbacks, PPAs, AUR, etc., nobody's vetting that. There's just nobody around to vet that. It would take thousands of people to go through all these snap packages, go line by line, to search for malicious code. No one's going to do that. Whose job is it then to do that? Well, to be honest, it's your job. <laughs> uh, anything that's not in your core repos, any third-party software you install in an extra repo, a community repo, Anything you use, universal formats like Snap, Flatpak, App Images, anything that you add repos, extra repos like PPAs, your AUR package builds, Gentoo overlays, etc. You are responsible for that stuff. Canonical is not responsible for it. Red Hat, uh, Arch, whoever, whoever you, what di distro you run, you are responsible for that. You went out and sought that software out. You installed it on your machine. You need to do the vetting. You need to, if you can, check out the source code. If you can't check out the source code because it's proprietary software, you might want to think twice about why you're installing that program to begin with. Like this very simple game, this 2048 game this guy had. Uh, the real 2048 game is licensed under free software, <laughs> the MIT license. Why wouldn't you install that? Why are you installing the proprietary version of that? Now, Again, that's assuming most people know about the difference in these licenses and care. Unfortunately, not a lot of people even know what proprietary and free and open source and all that stuff means. Even Linux users, a lot of them don't know about that stuff. Probably wouldn't care even if they did know about like the difference in licensing. 
But for those of you that do know better, yeah, stick to open source software. The proprietary garbage out there, especially you have two pieces of software, basically do the same thing. One of them's open source, one of them's closed source. Install the open source one. There's no reason to ever install the closed source one. So when, when you've got alternatives, free and open source alternatives. You know, I don't want to sound like Richard Stallman. I don't want to get on my Richard Stallman rant and, and get on that, like the GPL license versus MIT and BSD and Apache license and all that. But you know what? In a lot of ways, the GPL license is the perfect license. But I'm going to start sounding like a Free Software Foundation cheerleader. <laughs> so I'm going to get back to the chat for a minute. See what I miss. A lot of chat going by. I'm sorry if I missed some of the. Yeah, Tux gave the name of the programs 2048 Ubuntu and Hextris. Yep. And Ben Fitz Fitzpatrick, I've tried window managers. They're just too rough for me. No matter how I configure run them, they're just not for me. I stick with XFCE. Nothing wrong with XFCE. You use what works. Ultimately, that's what I tell everybody. Use what works. If you like where you're at, you know, don't hop. Let's see, Toss is in the chat. Ubuntu malware, welcome to the beginning of the year of the Linux desktop. Yeah, it's just what we need, you know, another negative story about Linux. But you know what, a lot of the mainstream stories about Linux, a lot of them tend to be negative. I've noticed that about, you know, mainstream press especially. Rarely do they highlight the positives that are going on with free and open source software and Linux in general. Uh, it, it tends to be the negative stories that really garner the attention. Mark Yates is in the house. How's it going, Mark? Checked out a couple of your videos. Mark, you guys might want to check out. He just started a YouTube channel. He's posted a couple of videos recently. Uh, Present Arms is in the chat. He just got the notification. Yeah, Yeah, I didn't give you guys much heads up on this stream. Sorry about that. Yeah, and that's why the AUR is dangerous in the wrong hands. Yeah. And people, you know, when you go to like Ubuntu's website and the forums, they always warn you about PPAs. Anytime you mention the AUR in the Arch forums, they always warn you. The AUR is not safe. Now, every person I know that runs Ubuntu adds PPAs. Every person I know that runs Arch uses the AUR. Uh, yes, they're not safe. But... You have to be smart about it. Uh, same thing with snaps. I often install GIMP as a snap package. You know why? I trust GIMP. The GIMP team is not going to install malware, spyware, some Trojan or Keylogger on my system. I trust GIMP. Firefox is also available as a snap. I don't have to worry about Mozilla doing anything weird, <laughs> you know, trying to slip something by me in their code. I don't have to properly vet Firefox. I trust Firefox as a snap. Joe Bob's Tetris game uh, on the Ubuntu Snap Store uh, that's licensed under proprietary license. Why would you install that thing? Why would you take that risk? So you do have to be smart, you know. Things that are packaged, you know, like if, you know, Microsoft packaged Skype as a snap. Yeah, I, I, even Microsoft, I trust they're not doing anything crazy <laughs> with that package. Uh, but just, you know, Billy Bob's, you know, puzzle game. No. Don't download that. Don't install that. Yeah. And we got Fidel Arnold in the chat. He says, hi, DT. Hey, Fidel. Yeah, Carl mentions the AUR gives popularity ranking ratings. That's nice. A lot of those popularity ratings, though, are mainly, hey, I installed the app, it worked, <laughs> or it didn't work. A lot of things in the AUR end up not working correctly. Ben Fitzpatrick, if somebody could help him with i3, that'd be cool. Yeah, I would love to help you, Ben, but I haven't used i3 yet, but I'm sure you, there's a million i3 users out there. i3 is a very popular tiling window manager. You'll find tons of tutorials on it. And tons of just config files out there. You just go on GitHub, rip somebody's config file. That's what most people do to start off with. Just borrow somebody else's config file that they've already set up. 
and then just tweak that one to your liking. Lamarck, he prefers Pac-Man, he rarely uses the AUR though. Yeah, it's good to avoid using the AUR if you don't have to, for safety reason. Safety reasons. Again, you really don't know what's in there. Now, when you use the AUR in Arch, you're really supposed to read the package build. Nobody does that. <laughs> when I'm installing an AU, AUR package, I never read the package build. I doubt most people do. So, uh, Tim F. asks, good question here. Will Clam TK catch this stuff? No, Clam TK catches, uh, is, is searching for known viruses and things of that sort. Uh, this would not be triggered. I mean, this slips right under the radar. <laughs> So, now yeah, real talks. <laughs> you trust Microsoft? Well, the Microsoft Skype app in the Snap Store, yeah. Yeah. I don't use Skype, though. But if I had to, yeah, I would install it. Like, if I had to meet with somebody, you know, for a teleconference, you know, anything, and we just had to use Skype, I'd install it. I prefer, you know, free alternatives, but... Yeah, Mark Yates. AUR is the real OG. Snaps who? I'm happy there are snaps, Flatpak, etc. It makes much more software available in Linux. Yep. Yeah, and another thing, we're focusing a, a lot on Ubuntu in this case and snaps. But it's not the distro and it's not even really the package format. This person could have done this in Fedora using Flatpaks. It, it, it would have been the, the same. <laughs> it would have just been right there on Flathub for you to get. Nobody would have noticed except for that particular GitHub user. Uh, for those of you that are just getting here, I highlight this guy. This is the guy that actually dug into the code a little bit and found the malicious code. T-A-R-W-I-R-D-U-R. <laughs> Toss mentions he fixed Brazero so he can burn CDs now. That's great, Toss. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure where you would uh, find a CD player now, though, because CDs are kind of like 20 years ago, but that's great. You, you got them up and running. And of course, I, I joke. I actually have a CD changer in my car still, so I do actually burn CDs. I have... Uh, Tim F., can you give us a quick tutorial as how to check what runs at startup? Well, if you're r wondering what's actually running on your machine right now, Tim, uh, just run HTOP or TOP or any kind of interactive process viewer. So on my machine here, let me get to an empty screen here. I'm going to show you guys this. So if I launch HTOP. You know, it's going to show me every single process that's currently running on my system right now. The owner of the process, uh, how much CPU it's taking, RAM it's taking, the niceness, the priority, all of that stuff. I won't get too detailed into this, but you would have saw that guy's whatever cryptocurrency miner, it would have been running, but he was trying to be, be cute with the name. It would have said something about System D in the name. <laughs> But it would be there. I mean, it would be in this list. It's running, you know, it, every process that's running on your system. You know, there's a, a, a file, a directory created in the proc folder in your root directory. And all of that, of course, is getting listed here in something like HTOP. So, yes, you can actually see what's running on your computer. Now, what you do with it that information again you would actually have to know what some of those processes are doing so th this guy again he named it system D whatever you know most people are not gonna think nothing of it it would have taken a little bit more investigating as, as what that process actually is yeah uh, we're getting back to clam AV and clam TK Clam TK is the GUI front end to Clam AV. Clam AV runs in the terminal. But Clam AV uses virus definitions. Yep, right. 
somebody actually has to say this is a virus this is what that virus looks like here's the code for it get submitted yeah then when you run your clam av scan which is in the terminal you type clam scan yeah if it finds that particular code somewhere yeah it would be triggered but this was not something that you know is known I'm not even sure if they would define what what this guy did as a virus anyway yeah and other top programs yeah I mentioned any kind of interactive process viewer we have gtop a, a top v top yep k crimson or just the standard top program in the terminal there's a lot of ways to figure out what processes are running on your machine and I didn't even mention the GUI uh, process viewers you guys running GNOME and KDE and all that uh, your system monitor has a uh, a processes tab that will also show you what's currently running on your machine as far as every process who created it etc yeah glances is another cool program you know, while we're talking about this Let's see Go to glances I think I have that hot keyed somewhere is this glances yeah this is glances similar to HTOP it shows similar information just kind of a different layout so we got at the top you know CPU mem swap uh, user system idle some memory stuff load network disk IO file system sensors and then of course here is our interactive processes uh, CPU percent memory vert res PID the process ID the user the user that created that process etc etc glances is a nice program a lot of chat I missed here I just looked on Amazon for CD players couldn't find one yeah CD players are, are kind of rare to find these days uh, what distro do you run at the moment I'm running Manjaro that is the Qtile tiling window manager on Manjaro <laughs> toss lol I'm assuming about the CD players yeah behind the times there toss but so am I I, I never on the like cutting edge of technology I'm always I'm, I'm retro I'm old school <laughs> You know, I would still be uh, using eight tracks if I could find an eight track player. <laughs> uh -huh. Right, and he's mentioning uh, K Crimson's trying to clarify. Yeah, that was running as a systemd service using a name systemd something or another, so it's disguised as a systemd component. Yeah. Yeah, because so much stuff is running in the background a lot of system D daemons are running in the background you'll see a lot of system D stuff if I open HTOP again you'll see system D running uh, oh, that's not HTOP though so any system D stuff in my processes here well a lot of it is Firefox and OBS because it's ranked by CPU and memory and they take a ton of CPU and, U and memory let's see well a lot of Firefox and uh, let's see some session stuff LX session a lot of LX session stuff system D user lib system D system D dash dash user right here you power you power D a lot of daemon stuff the D bus daemon etc so he just names it similar to some of those process names and you think no nothing of it <laughs> uh, have I considered starting a LFS series so uh, Linux from scratch no I haven't it would take a long time to get Linux from scratch installed especially I, I had to do it probably in a VM I couldn't give it my full system resources it would take forever I mean weeks to get through that install and then you know to cut it down all the video editing would be a massive undertaking and I'm not sure that many people would be interested in it, to be honest. I don't know, though. I won't completely rule it out, but at least right now, probably not. Uh, Stacy found CDs, though. Yeah, you can find CDs in Best Buy. I was in Best Buy the other day. They still have, a, like, a shelf, you know, with nothing but CDs and DVDs, rewritable CDs and DVDs. So you can still buy them. People still burn them. 
Apparently people don't play them, though, because you won't find CD players. Uh. Mark Yates, he loves the channel overlay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very nice touch. Simple is best, yeah. I'm not really much with graphics, and, it, and you know, I did all this in GIMP or whatever, but I like to keep things simple. I don't like too much clutter. Uh, Lamar, what do you think about Manjaro being recommended to a new user, DistroTube? I don't think Manjaro should be your very first distro. It's Arch-based. It's still a rolling release. Things are going to break on you. You're going to have little minor breakages. I know some people say, well, I've run Arch for five years and I've never had anything break on me. Well, they're meaning maybe they ran Arch for five years and they didn't have anything serious like a kernel panic or anything that, you know, just completely bricked their machine. Yeah. But how many times did you update and Pulse Audio no longer work correctly? Or Grub get boogered up in some way where you had to fix Grub or, you know, your NVIDIA drivers, you know, weren't working correctly when you upgraded or updated, you know. Yeah, you were able to fix those, but let's not pretend like you never had any breakages along the way. And for a new user, a brand new user to Linux, they're going to have no idea how to fix any of that. So I wouldn't recommend a rolling release distro of any kind for a new user. Oh, K Crimson. There's an old little robot thing I used to have called 2XL, and it used 8 tracks. I should find one again. Yeah. I should search for that too. Yeah, Omar's in the chat. He says, What's up? <laughs> Tim F., I listen to the Minnesota Twins ball games on a portable tube radio made in 1952. Old school rocks. Very cool. Pusang is in the chat. Hello, all. He's AFK, but listening. Yeah, this is why I like PC Linux OS. Just run Drac, Drac X services. You know what's running at a glance. Yeah. William, Linux from scratch is for nuts. Sorry, guys. Well, I don't know if it's for nuts. Most people use something like Linux for, from scratch uh, as a learning experience. Nobody re really chooses to run Linux from scratch. I mean, I say that. There are people that do, but it's not really meant to be like your daily driver you know again it's more of an educational thing <laughs> present arms yeah Linux from scratch is fun I did it in, in a VM once yeah no maybe I say I, I'm probably not gonna do it you know maybe I'll do it one day I don't know if I decided to do it of course I would do it for the channel it's not something I would personally just choose to do on my own. I just don't have that kind of time. It's not something that really interests me, to be honest. Because you go through this, yeah, you, maybe you learn a little something along the way, but at the end, what do you got? You're not actually going to use that Linux distro <laughs> that you've created. Uh, yeah, L LFS is Linux from scratch. Basically, you build Linux from the ground up. When it they say Linux from scratch, they mean... Linux from scratch. Like sometimes people talk about some of these distros that are kind of a pain, a difficult to install, you know, that or a lengthy process. Some people talk about Arch being that way. Arch, the Arch install is actually not very bad at all. It's pretty quick. If you can read a wiki and type some stuff in the terminal, you can have Arch up and running in half an hour. You know, depending on your machine and how fast you type. Uh, Gen two can take several hours or several days depending on the machine sometimes to get that installed. Linux from scratch, uh, plan to spend a couple of weeks on it at least. And yeah, you need to do it in a VM so you can save the VM and come back to it. Yeah, K Crimson, I had issues installing PC Linux OS a while back. Live disk didn't like my machine. I've only taken a look at PC Linux OS one time. I looked at it on the channel. It was an okay distro. The only thing that I had a problem with is installing it in a, inside VirtualBox. I could not get Grub to install properly. Grub 2. Oddly enough, I could get Grub 1, the older Grub, to install. Grub 2, for some reason, would not install. Alan Rocco, too much pain, Linux from scratch. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, Das Gregor. Uh, K Crimson men mentions a YouTuber named Das Gregor. Yeah, any of you guys that are interested in Gen 2 and especially Linux from scratch, that's the guy. You, you want to subscribe to his channel. Good stuff on both Gen 2 and Linux from scratch. And he actually, yeah, he like lives in Linux from scratch. Like he installs it and actually uses it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Sven Lackman is in the chat. Hello, DT. Hello, doll. Hey, Sven. He bought a new PC. He got the AMD Ryzen 1700X, 16 gigs of RAM, and a Radeon RX 480 with 8 gigs of graphics, G, uh, GDDR5 graphics. Very cool. First, he wiped out Windows 10. Very cool. For now, I am on Ubuntu 1804. Also very cool. Zvin, you're a cool guy. <laughs> uh, honestly, Derek, I'm kind of wanting to buy all my next songs and albums on CD if I can and then burn to my computer so I own my stuff. Yeah. Well, you don't even have to do all that. I mean, now you can buy them all digital. You know, just buy them off of Amazon or whatever you use. Just get the digital versions of those songs. The MP3s or whatever, the flags, whatever they sell them as. That way you don't have to bother buying a CD, ripping them from the CD. Unless you want the physical CD. The problem with physical CDs, if you have a ton of music, you end up with a lot of CDs. Like, I have a hard drive, an external hard drive, actually an SSD drive, that I have 130 gigs of music saved to. Most of it's classical music. Being a classical mu musician, that's uh, kind of my trade back in the day. I'm a classically trained trombonist. It's my main instrument. So I have you know, studied a lot of music composition, music history. So I set out to basically like every major composer I could think of, collect recordings of every work they ever did. Just to have a library of it. Anytime I was playing something, I wanted to check it out. I had a recording. Uh, so 130 gigs of classical music. Now, if I had all that on CDs, uh, I mean, it, it would fill, fill a room. I think the, the run time on that 130 gigs of music is... I forget what the hour runtime was. It was over a thousand hours of runtime. All right, Mars. What do you think about the new Spectre Intel chips without a fix for perhaps up to a year? Yeah, that's unfortunate. Intel is really uh, they're dropping the ball. What we really need is more open hardware. That's what I would hope would eventually come about of all this. We, we talk about free and open software so much and how great it is. It's so much better than closed software, but we really need open, we really need open hardware to be a thing. Sadly, it's, it's not really a thing yet. And present arms. That was the July or similar ISO DT, I believe. I had hassles with that on bare metal as well. You're probably talking about what I mentioned about PC Linux OS. If that was the case, yeah. Q1 Fiend is in the chat. I thought about installing Gen 2 just to see the horror show of days compiling. Well, it depends on your machine. If you have a top end machine with a really good CPU, multi core CPU, uh, the the run the uh, install time is not too bad. I mean, several hours still. If you have a old machine with a really crappy processor, like this laptop behind me, I have a uh, Solus running on. It has a AMD A8 processor. Really, not a top of the line CPU at all. Probably Gen 2 would take two or three days to compile on that thing. Maybe, maybe longer. I'm actually not sure, but it would be a pain. When you're compiling software, uh, you really need a good CPU. And that's you're just compiling software in general, even if you were compiling a package on your machine. Now, one package, it's not a big deal. With Gentoo, you compile everything. So you're talking about very long wait times, especially you know big packages, like compiling the kernel, which is millions of lines of code.
If you don't need to be an expert on Linux, you don't need to install Gentoo. I'm not sure that installing Gentoo makes you an expert on Linux. Uh, <laughs> it's another misconception about certain distros. A lot of Arch users will tell you you need to install Arch because you learn a lot about Linux. Same thing with Gentoo. You learn a lot about Linux when you do a Gentoo install. Uh, you learn how to read their wikis. Whether you actually learn anything is how much you're willing to invest in actually learning what you're doing. But just reading a wiki and typing some stuff in a terminal, you're not really learning anything. And you're not, definitely not an expert on Linux because you were able to get through a Gentoo install. A lot of chat here. So I'm sorry, I probably miss some of you guys here. Scrolling kind of fast. I know on my uh, OBS screen, what you guys are seeing, you know, it's, it's going by kind of fast. A lot of people in the chat this evening. All right. I'm going to take a sip of my beverage. Now I'll try to catch up on some of the chat here. All right, Stacy. Are the new AMD graphics and processors good with Linux? Yep. Yeah, AMD is great with Linux. The processors are, are fantastic. I, I, I usually just buy a AMD processors. Nothing wrong with them. The a AMD graphics cards used to, everybody recommended NVIDIA on Linux because the proprietary drivers are just great. The NVIDIA ones anyway. The AMD drivers kind of lag behind. Nowadays, a lot of people say AMD is just as good. If you're running open source drivers, AMD is probably better. They have better open source drivers than the NVIDIA drivers. But you know what? I have played around with the open source NVIDIA drivers on my 1060 that I just bought. It's actually not bad, the NVIDIA open source drivers. So graphics drivers are, are getting better. better. Definitely better than they were just a few years ago. All right, I've got the chat kind of jumping around here. It's hard for me to keep up with where I was at. Uh, I have three one terabytes external of music. So you have three one terabyte drives and they're all full of music? Or <laughs> surely not. That's a lot of music. I thought I had a lot with 130 gigs. If you have three terabytes of music, uh, there's some duplicated stuff in there. Yeah, he said, actually, he made the next sentence. Yeah, a lot is duplicated. Okay. Alex, you can learn about Linux using any distro you want. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Uh, if you want to run Arch and don't want to take the time to learn anything about Linux, you can. If you want to run something like Ubuntu or Elementary or Mint, and you want to really dig deep and learn everything there is to, be, to, to know about Linux, you can do that on those distros. Uh, the install process really doesn't teach you that much about what Linux is, what Linux all is all about. So, going through a hard installation doesn't really, you know, you're not certified as a Linux master. <laughs> Although, don't tell that to some of the Arch fanboys. I've seen some of the kids in the forums, they're so proud that they got through that Arch install. You know. All right, what Linux distro on Alienware 15 R2? Uh, I'm not sure on that one. Never had Alienware. Stacy Luster is mention, mentioning System76 and Purism are presenting open hardware. Yeah, I'm actually pretty interested in that. And I hope that works out well. I would consider uh, buying something like that, too. You know what I really should actually purchase something from System76 at some point. Their machines are a little pricey. It's the only reason. You know, I'm kind of cheap. I usually buy kind of mediocre at best equipment. Subpar usually is what I go with. I don't buy top-end equipment at all for the most part. Yep, ATI is much better now with Linux. Yep. Uh, Tim F., what's the flavor tonight? Beer-wise. Corona. One of my favorites, as far as, you know, you can find it in any, like, gas station or, you know, like, some of the really 
my favorite stuff, like from Germany and England, you know, you got to go to specialty shops. But like any gas station you go to, you'll always find Corona Extra. It's a decent beer. Yeah, Stacy Luster asked several hours to install Gen 2 question mark. Yeah. Yeah. You better uh, have a day set aside. Your whole the whole day. At least. And again, it might it might bleed over into day two or day three in some cases, so a lot of folks talking about their music collections, very large, about formats, uh, MP3 and FLAC. I, I wish my 130 gigs of classical music was all FLAC. It's not. Some of it is, but most of it's MP3. And there is a difference, especially with something like classical music. You can really tell the difference between something like FLAC versus MP3. Because MP3, of course, is a compressed format. It's just not as good. And toss I was talking to Tim F he could jump on for a few I suppose have no topic or notes but who cares that's the spirit toss most of the time I don't have a topic planned and I do these streams and notes <laughs> man you, you do notes you do prep work I've never done any prep work <laughs> for a stream <laughs> uh. I know the next response is going to be it shows <laughs> from Toss. <laughs> uh, Sven mentions, to learn Linux, just get into it. Surely you will fall, but it's just how strong you will stand up. Yeah, really. Really, to, to learn Linux by a book, <laughs> I mean, yeah, just start reading. Read online, read wikis, you know, just, and play around. You know, VMs are a great way to learn Linux. Because you, if you damage the VM, so what? Hmm. And Stacy, thanks, Derek. I'll keep that in mind. Still, though, for my usage, I'll stick with my new old reliable, the 2014 Asus, is that the X555 LA laptop. Yeah. So you got about a four-year-old Asus. Yeah. My, that's about a four-year-old uh, Toshiba behind me, Toshiba satellite. Not a great machine, but it's, it works. Again, I, I buy the cheapest things going. Yeah, Tim if you drinking Newcastle? I love Newcastle. Now, that's one I can often find you know, in gas stations, too. Not every gas station, but it, it's, it's popular enough. Yeah, I can find Newcastle pretty much anywhere. iCubic mentions Ubuntu has gone to shambles. Well, I don't know. I don't know if... If Ubuntu can really do anything about some of this. If somebody wants to package something and put something crazy in it, anybody can do it. Again, this wasn't like something in the Ubuntu core repos either. Yeah, so we have to qualify this a little bit. And again, this guy, he could have done this on any distro he wanted. He could have done this with any... Uh, package format he wanted. He didn't have to pick Snaps. He didn't have to pick Ubuntu. He could have done Fedora and Flatpak. He could have done Arch and an AUR package. Or, or he could have done a PPA or an app image. Or, or he could have just write a malicious script, put it on GitHub and, you know, posted links on Facebook and Twitter. Hey, go download this cool game. People would have done it. And Kay Crimson is giving us some advice here. Make sure your Etsy slash pulse slash daemon dot config is set right so you can appreciate FLAC better. Okay. I did not know that. I'll have to check that out too. Alex. Level 1. Installed Arch by scratch. Level 2. Install Gentoo and succeed. Level 3. Install and compile Linux from scratch. Yeah, that's a good game plan. Yeah, Stacy mentions my line, just use what works. Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, when I started this channel, this uh, my main production machine, I was running Ubuntu 16.04, you know, the old LTS. Why? Because it was a 15-minute install when I installed it, and it just worked. And once I had something up and it's, it just works, I don't hop. I'm not really, the, I mean, I know I hop a lot on the channel, but I'm not really a hopper. 
I'm not just itching to wipe out my machine and go through the trouble of restoring, you know, backing up and restore. That, that's a lot of time. Especially for something I've already got set up and working exactly the way I want it. So, for me, it doesn't matter. You know, Ubuntu, Arch, Gen 2, Fedora, whatever. Give me a distro. As long as it works, I'm sticking with it. Of course, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I use these minimal window managers. You guys know how much I love Openbox and Qtile, Xmonad. And when you use the, these minimal window managers with your own personal configs, you can pick any distro on the DistroWatch Top 100. And when I install my Openbox desktop with my configs, it's going to function the exact same way on any of those 100 distros. You would never tell the difference. The only time you will notice you're running whatever distro you're running is when you actually have to open a terminal and maybe do something with the package manager. Because then, you know, package management is a little different. You know, apt, pacman, emerge, dnf, etc. Other than that, exactly the same. Now, you guys that are running full desktop environments like GNOME, KDE, XFCE, you guys notice differences because not everybody's GNOME is the same as the next guy's GNOME because nobody is really shipping vanilla GNOME except Arch and Fedora to some extent. But, you know, Ubuntu adds extensions. You know, they add their own wallpapers and theming and everything, and so does SUSE. Sebion, <laughs> name whatever GNOME distro Anter goes, and you know they do their own thing with GNOME. So everybody's GNOME edition is a little different because that's their vision of GNOME or KDE or whatever. You know, when I install OpenBox or Xmonad or Qtile or i3 or whatever, you know, that's nobody else's version of i3. That's the configs that I wrote, that I put on my GitHub page, I pulled down, you know. And that's going to look the same regardless of the distro. And Toss mentions he's going to share his uh, Brazero fix. Yeah. For those of you that follow Toss the other night on his stream, he was mentioning he was having a problem burning CDs with Brazero. Which I actually haven't tried to burn a, a CD or a DVD in so long. I never use Brazero though. I use K3B. I've always found that to be the, the best disk burning program on Linux. Uh, Lamar, DistroTube, have you tried to use Slackware? I have not looked at Slackware in a long, long time and I've never used it for any length of time. I remember I installed a old version of Slackware. And by old, I mean this was four or five years, maybe six years ago. I took a look at a Slackware version back then where I installed it in a VM, played around with it, I don't know, a few days, maybe a couple weeks. Didn't get into it that much. I wasn't doing something like this channel back then. Back then, I was just occasionally checking out, you know, new distros that were released. And I did take a, a very brief look at Slackware back then, but it's been a long time. I don't really know anything about Slackware. I should take a look at Slackware on the channel at some point. Yeah, Stacy mentions about his four-year-old laptops. Four years still kicking. Sadly, most of these newer laptops, they make it almost impossible to repair anything. Yeah, that's the problem with laptops. Hmm. Yeah, Tux. Brazero equals coasters. Yeah. A lot of times you, you burn a CD or DVD and... Sometimes it even like pretends like it actually wrote it, but you go to play it, nothing. And then if it's not a rewritable CD, you know, it's basically a coaster at that point. <laughs> Ron leaves to toss. Spatry would be proud of you getting Brazero running. Yeah. iCubic, really the only thing I need to be happy is Emacs and the internet. And K Crimson's talking about Arch installs are easy and quick for the most part. You guys, I, I did an Arch install uh, three or four weeks ago, I think, on the channel. I did it in a VM, but the day before, I actually did it on my physical hardware. I lived in Arch, if you guys recall, for about two weeks on my main production machine. So I did the Arch install on my main production machine. I couldn't record that, though. So the next day, I did the same Arch install in a VM, recorded that. It's a pretty straightforward process. I mean, it's not difficult. 
at all. I mean, I wouldn't want to, this, nobody that's a new user probably needs to do it because even though you can get through the Arch install, running Arch and maintaining Arch is not for a new user. The install, though, is not that bad. Yeah, Stacy, uh, taking apart my laptop isn't going to be a walk in the park, so I just choose to run my Linux install off an external SSD uh, or via USB. Yeah. Okay, guys, well, stream's been up and running for an hour. I really didn't have anything planned here, so I just wanted to share the malware story about the Ubuntu snaps. I'm briefly going to mention that before I close the stream for those that are just joining. Uh, pull back up the OMG Ubuntu article. We'll briefly recap this. Earlier today, there was a story. Malware found in two snaps in the Ubuntu Snap Store. Basically, this guy put a couple of little games in the Ubuntu Snap Store. He included a, some malicious code in there uh, to mine bitcoins, basically. Basically, it takes your system resources, a little bit of your system resources, and it mines for cryptocurrency. He disguised this by having you think it was like some sort of System D daemon running in the background. You know, he disguised the, the name in such a way to make you think it's some kind of System D process. Uh, a GitHub user, this GitHub user, T-A-R-W-I-R-D-U-R, -R -R, however you pronounce that, I'll link it in this, the description, this GitHub user, was kind enough to find that code and report it. That's another thing. When you find these kinds of things, report it. A lot of people will find malicious code like this. They don't even know what to do with it. I mean, they find it. You know, I'm not going to install that on my machine. Well, what about the rest of us? This guy was nice enough. Hey, Canonical, this is what's going on. So big props to that guy. Uh, you know, is this kind of stuff preventable? That's the article here asks. Uh... It is preventable, but honestly, and what I was one of the points I was getting at was it's preventable only if you prevent it. Canonical can't prevent it. Uh, the uh, Ubuntu community really can't prevent it. And even if they ask for volunteers, and they got thousands of volunteers to read lines of code, you know, through all these apps, stuff is going to slip through. It it just is. Who ultimately who's responsible for what gets installed on your system is you. Again, there's core repos, the Ubuntu core repos, the Arch core repos, what have you. Yeah, those distros need to make sure everything in that core repo is squared away, that there is nothing in the way of malware, spyware in that, but third-party stuff, your PPAs, your AUR, snaps, flat packs, app images, anything you compile yourself because you got it from GitHub, anything, a Python script or a package you install with pip, anything you install with npm, uh, a Haskell package you install with Cabal, you know, all these package managers. You know what, you might want to check what these packages are doing, what they're exactly installing on your system, what they're going to be doing when they're running on your system. It's work. Nobody, nobody's going to do that. I'm not even going to do that. But ultimately, who's responsible? I am. So if I install something and something bad happens to my machine, ultimately, who's responsible? I am. I wouldn't blame Manjaro in my case because that's what I'm running currently or Ubuntu or whoever no it's not their fault it's my fault anyway catching up a little bit on the chat I'm gonna shut down the stream in about two or three minutes let's see yeah Bill Gates mentions he read somewhere Ubuntu will be LXQ yeah that's coming eventually that's been in the works for a while I, w I would definitely say by the next LTS release of L Lubuntu, it'll be on LXQ. But probably one of the interim releases before that. Because you don't want to switch on the next LTS. You want to switch before the LTS so you have a, a version or two to get the bugs squared away. Yeah, Tim F. DistroTube, I just found a DVD for a Zorn 6 install. Very cool. Present arms. Not had a glitch yet. I believe the Lubuntu is switching from the GTK version to the Q. Yeah. So they're switching from LXDE, which is, yeah, GTK, to LXQt, which is cute. So. Yeah, Stacy mentions he hasn't burned a CD or DVD in a long time either. Yeah. 
it used to be my preferred method. Like I used to keep live DVDs of distros around, uh, just because I had DVD. I, I burned DVDs a lot, so I had them. So I would make live DVDs of distros, you know, like for a system rescue DVD. But nowadays, most people don't have optical drives to play those, you know, to rescue their system. So unless I'm bringing an external drive, you know, USB sticks are the way to go now. Because everybody's machine is going to have at least a couple of USB ports. So. And Kay Crimson, thanks for the stream. Have a good night. See you, Kay. Glad you could stop by. Tim F., thanks for another good one, Derek. Keep it up. Appreciate that, Tim. Alan Rocco, great show. Thanks, Alan. Present Arms, I installed the Community Edition of PC Linux OS and then installed Task LX Qt in that. Very cool. Present Arms, also excellent stream. Thanks. You guys are awesome. Especially, you know, you guys that are regular on the stream here. I mean, I didn't even give you guys a heads up. I mean, I, I, I sent out a notification 15 minutes before I hit the start stream button. And about 10 or 15 of you were here <laughs> about two minutes into the stream. It's crazy. <laughs> Tux1313. DT, thanks for the heads up. You know? yep. Ron Lee says thanks. See you later. Good to see you, Ron. Much appreciated. Yep, thank you for the stream, Ricardo. Pusang, optical storage safe from M EMPs. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to shut it down for this evening. But before I go, I do need to do a special thanks to my patrons. A.K. Ron, Mr. Neely, Mr. Neely Pops, John, Brian, Carl, Greg, Carlos, Rob, Matt, Darkwin, Mark, Christian, Jake, Benjamin, Stephen, Marcus, Interceptor, Bob, Lior, Omar, Silvio. You guys are awesome. You guys help make this show possible. Peace, guys. Thank <laughs> you.